Here's how one side hustler earns thousands of dollars a month and how you can too. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because the difference between scarcity and abundance might only be one sale away. In this episode, I'm excited to revisit the popular side hustle of buying low and selling high with an inspiring guest, Stacy Gallego. Thanks to her part time flipping business, Stacy's been able to scale way back at her nursing job. She's been able to travel more, to spend more time with her family. Now, what's cool about this income stream is it was actually inspired by a former Side Hustle Show guest, Rob the Flea Market Flipper Stevenson, who we last heard from in episode 298. Stacy's one of Rob's star students, and I've loved watching her share some of her sales results over the last year or so. The ability or the skill to find a profit in your hometown is one way, I think, to really recession-proof your life. And if that appeals to you, I encourage you to check out Rob and his wife, Melissa's free training at SideHustleNation.com slash FMF for Flea Market Flipper to learn more. That is my referral link for their Flipper University program, but it's all good stuff. And you'll see how Stacy has been implementing it in this episode. If you stick around, you hear how she consistently sources profitable inventory, how she deals with the logistics of transporting and shipping sometimes some pretty huge items, and her advice for new flippers to start making money. Notes and links for this episode, along with the full text summary with all of Stacy's top tips from the call, are at sidehustlenation.com slash flip it, all one word, flip it. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with Stacy after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. I never dreamed that I could do this. I, I just kind of fell into it. I found Rob and Melissa on a blog and started listening to how what their business model was, which was basically focusing on selling larger items for a lot more money versus where a lot of people just sell a lot of volume and ship a lot. And I just thought, I want to work smarter, not harder. So I figured if I could make a thousand bucks a month, that'd be really cool. And I pretty much consistently started that right away where I was making, you know, an extra thousand a month. And then it just moved into 4,000 up until last month, which is, I've been doing it almost two years now. And last month I had, I was $4 short of 10,000. Wow. Is it sales or, or profit after your, your cost of acquisition? Sales. So my profit would be around 7,000. Okay. Still. Yeah. I was thrilled. I never really had it on my radar to quit my job. I love my job. I love the people I work with. So it was never really on my radar until I started realizing it was really everything I wanted. You know, I had the freedom. I could spend time with my kids. My husband just retired at 56 from the federal government. And, you know, we can have breakfast in the morning. We can take walks. We can hang out. And it's just been really great. And I can travel for 30 days and make 4000 bucks. It's not too bad. Not too bad at all. We're going to unpack some of the sourcing process, the constant hunt for inventory, remarketing, shipping some of these larger items. Excited to dive into to all of that. But you draw an important consideration here. And Rob, who Stacy mentioned, has been on the podcast a couple of times. They run fleamarketflipper.com. The idea, and this is in contrast to, we've done episodes on flipping uh, textbooks or flipping like thrift store clothing and selling on Poshmark, where it's like, I might make 10 bucks an item. Rob's idea is like, in the early days, it was like, if I'm not making a hundred bucks an item, like there's a lot of effort here in sourcing and photographing and listing and shipping the stuff. Like I want to make it worth my while. And it's like very much, it's very, very possible to play this volume game. But his argument, it sounds like yours is as well. It's like, maybe I could do a similar amount of of work up front for just one item and just, you know, make sure that item happens to be a home run where I double or triple my money. But let's dive into this inventory sourcing. Can you give me an idea of where you're looking for profitable inventory? What kind of stuff are you buying? Well, this is the thing that I tell people who are interested in getting into the business never stick to one way of sourcing. I really try to have several ways that I source. I source at yard sales and not so much now because of pandemic. There's not a lot of sales happening right now. I go to thrift stores. My big finds are usually on OfferUp, Facebook Marketplace, LetGo, 
just the local apps. And my goal really is to find those undervalued items locally and then resell them on a larger market. So I never really stick to one thing. I'm always looking for new ways to source. And my biggest new way, which is I learned from a private coaching group from Rob, and that was that to build contacts. I tell people what I do. At first, you kind of keep it to yourself because you you don't want to bug people with your new business idea or whatever. And so you don't always say what you do. But you know, I started sharing that with people. And instead of them throwing out their items, they give them to me. And then I sell them and I can either give them part of the profit or if they're going to dump them in the garbage, I'll take them and, and flip them and add to my inventory. And then when I, I have several contacts, just locally, one guy cleans out houses and then he sells me stuff very inexpensive. And then I have another guy that works at a thrift store locally and he and I have a really good connection where he basically lets me shop shop at a store before he puts the stuff out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's really awesome. Shoot, and- shoot. Everybody else who's like going in there, you know, as the door opens, like, oh, the good stuff has already been picked up. <laughs> right. Believe me, there's plenty of really good stuff. There's all kinds of ways to get items and you can just make a really good living doing it. Is there a reason that somebody listing on Facebook Marketplace or OfferUp or Leco or Craigslist isn't valuing their item properly or are you coming in with a lowball offer? Just kind of curious about the the mechanics there. Well, that can be a lot of reasons why people want to get rid of something. Maybe they don't know what it is. I, I try not to play that game. I don't want to take advantage of anybody in any way. But there's people that are moving, so they may be just needing to get rid of their stuff. Otherwise, they're going to have to pay to have it moved, and they really don't want the item anyway. There's items, like for instance, I just purchased a piece of equipment for a person that's disabled. And the guy sold it to me very inexpensive because he had family members that were using it that were no longer using it, and he just needed to get it out of his garage. So those are opportunities that basically we can help them by instead of them dumping it somewhere in a landfill, you know, we can pick it up and they get money and they're happy with it. And I just figure as long as they're happy and we can come to an agreement, it's a good deal for both of us. Right. Ends up being a a win-win. Like, I don't want to deal with it. And that's kind of been a lot of our stuff that I have sold or even maybe mistakenly given away or, or set out in the bulky item pickup for the garbage collectors. Like, I just don't want to deal with it. And you're like, look, I'm I'm willing to deal with it, especially for the stuff that you think might be worth several hundred dollars or or more. So equipment for disabled person, any other, you know, home run finds that you care to share? Well, a couple of my favorites are I found a it's a town and country vintage skateboard. I found it at a yard sale. And I just looked up the name quickly on eBay, and I could see that some of them were selling for quite a bit. And this one was in mint condition. I mean, like it had never even been used. So I asked him, well, what do you want? He said, five bucks. And I thought, I'll take a chance on five bucks. So I didn't even, I don't skateboard or anything, so I didn't know anything about it, which is kind of the fun part of the business. A lot of the things that I get, I have no idea what they are or even what they're used for but I can figure out how much they're worth and be able to sell them. So I grabbed it. I took photos of it because I was really concerned because it was so nice that maybe it's not genuine or real. So I took photos of it and I sent a message to the company where it was made in Hawaii. And the guy, immediate, they didn't even make the skateboard anymore. They only were making surfboards. So he sent me a message back and offered to buy it for 300 bucks. And I thought, oh, okay. This is worth some money. So I listed it on eBay and sold it five days later for $650. Wow. So <laughs> I never even heard of it. A town and country vintage skateboard. All right. So if you're outsourcing, be on the lookout for those if you can find them. Yeah. So that was really fun. And then the guy was, he had one when he was a kid, wanted another one. So it was really fun to kind of connect him with something that he, nostalgia from when he was a kid. So that was really fun too. And Another one of my favorites was, this is just a recent one that I sold. It was a motorcycle sidecar, which was so cool. It was from 2001. It was a convertible with a little 
like a trunk in the back. It was such a cool little car. Rob helped me find that when I did a private coaching group with him and he found it for me. I went down and negotiated. The people just wanted to throw it out. They were just like, we just need to get it out of here. So we gave him $200 and I sold it for $3,300 on eBay. And my husband and I shipped it. And and that was one that I, I sold that while I was on the beach in Florida, enjoying my vacation. <laughs> A nice little little three thousand dollar profit there, minus whatever uh, eBay listing fee. Right. This kind of leads to the next question: Is like that sounds like not a small item. It sounds like something that is going to have to go in a crate on a pallet. I don't <laughs> rent a U-Haul and drive it to the seller. Like, tell me about the logistics side of shipping some of this bigger stuff. Okay. Well, that's really what I loved about Rob when I found them on. I was searching around. I thought, well, how can I get this $20,000 for the RV? I had signed up for WAG, like a dog walking. And I thought, I'm going to have to walk a thousand dogs to even get (laughs) close to, that's not going to cut it. And so I saw him and his wife, Melissa, talking about how they freight shipped. And I said, this is it. I can do this. I know I can do this. So I told my husband, this is what I'm going to do. And he's like, we are not doing that or anything like it. And I thought, oh, well, that didn't work good. So I thought, my husband's the type of person that if he sees it and he understands what's happening, he'll figure it out and say, okay, yes. So that's what I did. I started buying larger items that I wouldn't normally have bought. And I was making a really, really good profit. Okay. But meanwhile, he thinks this is an awful idea. Like, you brought this into our garage. Like, what is going on here? (laughs) Exactly. And that's when I kind of talked him into doing a freight item. I just said, you know, let me just try it. And so that that actually was my first experience. I bought another disability machine. I got it for $125 and I sold that one for $3,100. And that was our first experience. And Rob was amazing. He actually called us up on the phone, walked us through it. And then after you do the first one, it's not very hard. Of course, my husband's very valuable to my business, and he is great at putting the pallets together, but it's not as hard as one thinks, and it's way better to make $3,000 off of one sale than ship out 300 things, because it's just the time. I didn't want to spend that much time, so that's kind of how we got started. Yeah, walk 300 dogs, so (laughs) when you're comparing it against these alternatives, like, yeah, there's some stuff that I haven't done before, but I can figure it out. And if that involves freight shipping, so it sounds like so you're building a pallet in the garage. So there's a trip to the lumber yard, trip to the hardware store here. And then who do you call to get quotes for that? You can't, you can't roll up to the post office and say, I need to send this motorcycle sidecar across the country. There's free pallets everywhere. You can go grab a free pallet from any grocery store or places that people are giving them away. And you can measure it. If it fits, you can use it. Just strap the item down to the pallet and cellophane it, put the plastic wrap around it. And then our personal, the freight company that I use, they require that you put sides on it, sides on the pallet. So basically, it's more like a carton or a crate. Yeah, it's not as hard as you think. You just get a few nails and put it together and pretty soon you're shipping it out. And then I personally use YRC Freight. It's a really good company. They're very reasonable. And then I just take it down to the freight terminal and I set up the pickup for the person who bought it. And we communicate until they receive it. I follow it all the way to, to them, make sure everything goes smoothly. And, you know, we've sold quite a few things that way and it's gone really well. What did it cost to ship this thing? The motorcycle sidecar? Yeah, what did it cost to ship the sidecar? Now, that one was a little bit more expensive because this one was going to New York, which is the furthest place from me. So I think it was $550, which that's not the norm. I would say I can ship anything across the U.S. for $300, $350, you know, if it's huge. But I'd say the average is around $150 to $200. So it's not that expensive. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you have $3,000 worth of margin built into your product, you're like, shoot, yeah, I'll pay 500 bucks for shipping. Right. Do you list it as free shipping on eBay or is it like TBD based on the quote that I get back? 
sometimes I try to do free shipping with my items just because it opens up. People get nervous. Believe it or not, people who buy from you with freight shipping are as nervous as the person shipping it. We think, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to be able to figure this out? But they're actually as nervous as we are because most people don't deal with things don't get freight shipped to them very often. So I try to do free shipping because that just gives them a little bit more security that they're not going to, some people won't even bother with it if they just see, call me for a freight quote, because they'll assume it's going to be very expensive. So I try to build it in, into my price. So, Do you have a buy it now price in mind or that you set versus auctions? Right. I don't deal with auctions unless there's something that's like a specialty item or something like the skateboard, you know, where you just don't know how much it could go for. Those kind of things I'll do in auction, but most of the time I do a buy it now. Okay. So you're arriving at that buy it now price from just looking at what comparable products have sold for? Yep. I do the research and I find out what I kind of compare the condition of my item compared to the other condition, you know, of the item sold. And then I just put together a price and and sometimes people will, you know, send me a message, would you take $100 less or, you know, I have that option if I want to do that, I can I can do that or not. Yeah, so it's, there is some built-in negotiating that can happen on on the eBay platform. Is that the primary sales outlet is like, hey, this is the the overarching strategy, find undervalued items locally and then resell them to a nationwide audience. Yep, that's it. Because, you know, I think eBay has 180 million users. The local market here, I think maybe 60,000 people could see it. So, I mean, if you want to get it sold, you know, that's the way to do it. And they just have so many people that are willing to pay for it because maybe they can't get it where they are. I was going to ask, I have a guess at your answer, but I was going to ask if there's any areas of specialization here where it's like the motorcycle sidecar automotive accessory type of stuff, medical equipment, sporting goods? Like, Have you found a category of products to be better than any other? Well, I think one of my favorite things that I like to sell are sleep number beds. That's probably my favorite thing. I can get them very inexpensive here. People in Tucson move quite a bit. People are just trying to get rid of their stuff or they upgrade to, you know, the next greater sleep number bed that's $5,000 and they now don't care about their bed that they've had for 10 years. But for me, I can sell it. I split the bed apart and I sell the parts and I do very, very well, very well with that. And I enjoy very much selling them. They're really fun to sell. And I also like cooktops or commercial equipment or anything weird. Like I just recently found it was like a money counter. That was fun. A money counter and then a coin counter. The guy sold me both of them for $75 and I sold them each for $600. Wow. So I just find strange stuff. I've through working with Rob and watching him and learning from him, I've developed that eye for very expensive things that are undervalued. And I'm learning to take some risks too, you know, and just learn as I go, which, which has been, you know, and that's part of the business too. This is fascinating. Sleep number beds. I found a niche in sleep number beds. Again, a super bulky thing, but if you've got a system to figure out how to sell those. I mean, same thing with all of this stuff is looking for something that is pretty specialized and it's going to have a hard time selling locally. And so it makes sense to open that up to this nationwide audience. I don't know if you do anything internationally, but this nationwide audience that if they're going to find it or if they're wanting to not buy it new from the manufacturer, then eBay is the place. Right. And believe it or not, with sleep numbers, they come apart. You unzip them take the air out of them. I fold them up and put it. People are shocked. They, I come to pick one up and they say, oh, you didn't bring a truck? Because, you know, it's all inflated and everything. And I come in, unzip it, take it down. They're like, we had no idea that you could <laughs> actually do this. They're like, you have done this before. Right. They're easy to ship. They're easy to store. And they're really fun. Really, really a fun little niche. And I enjoy it. That's awesome. Now, I imagine that some of the stuff doesn't sell right away. Like you're waiting for that perfect specialized buyer to find your listing on eBay and say, yes, I need that. But in the meantime, you have collected a garage full of random uh, assorted sleep number beds and commercial cooktops and stuff. 
Is that it? Is it is it the garage stacked to the brims or is there a different storage solution? Well, when I started out, it started getting a little stacked up. But then I realized with these specialty items and the larger items, it does take a little bit of time for people to buy them. So you might hang on to them 30, 60, even 90 days. But the way I figure it for if I paid $100 for something and I'm going to make $3,000, it's worth keeping it around. So But as I got started and started kind of accumulating more things, I just went and got a storage unit. And that was just because my husband likes to have things tidy. Well, I do too. But, you know, and I don't like my garage filled up with stuff and I can't fit my car. And it was worth it for us to invest in that. It's very close to my house. When I sell something, I just go grab it and ship it. If it's a large item, we take the trailer over there, go pick it up and put it on the pallet and take it down to the terminal. So it works really well for us. Although I don't recommend people starting out that you just go right away and get a storage unit because there's so much you can do on smaller items just to kind of get your feet wet and get some a little experience before you invest in a storage unit. But Do you need a truck to do this business? You don't. We didn't have a truck. We don't have a truck, actually. We have, for the first year and a half, we just had friends that would help us out. I'd give them 40 bucks to let me use their truck and I'd take it down to the terminal and, you know, it worked out good or we'd do trades, you know, I'd do something for them and then they'd let us use their truck. But then as we started really doing some freight shipping where it was getting more and more common, we just went down to Harbor Freight. We bought a $300 trailer. My husband put it together and we went and took one of our vans and put on a tow package and that's how we do it. Very inexpensive to get the job done. So yeah, I'm always curious about like, well, now I got to move this giant thing and I've got a small SUV, but okay, here's the trailer attachment. I don't know. I might have a tow package. I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hold very much, but it might, it might work. Have you had any inventory that's sitting at this storage locker for six months, nine months? Like it's just not selling the way you thought it would. You're like, I, I got to get my money out of here. I'm curious if there's any goal metrics on like inventory turning. Right. It doesn't happen to me very often, but it does happen. And I, I actually just, I had a pair of boots. They're brand new. I got them at a yard sale. This is when I was starting out and I probably paid too much for them. And I had those things listed for, I think, two years and I just sold them yesterday. So it happens. I just try to recoup my money. If there's, if I get something and it's not what I expected, I just won't lose money on it. I'll sell it to get rid of it or I just wait. Right now I have a a Viking oven that I haven't sold yet. It's beautiful in mint condition. I just haven't found the right buyers, but I have a lot of people that are watching it. So I have no doubt I'll I'll sell it. I may have to lower the price, but I'll still make a really good profit on it. Yeah, that's kind of the, there's a patience side of this game that you don't always see. Well, well, I picked it for 20 bucks and I sold it for 150. And you're like, this is awesome. Like I want in, but it's like this, the waiting game of <laughs> like, oh, I, I'm waiting for this payday and, you know, I'm getting nervous. Like, I haven't sold. Should I lower my price? Should I stick to my guns? I can feel a little bit of that here where especially, you know, if it's still at the stage where your husband is skeptical over this thing, he's like, sure, you made 3000 on this one thing, but how much more you got tied up in inventory in there, you know? Yeah. You know, my husband is like, he's so happy about it now because he just retired at the end of December. And it's just been such a fun side hustle for both of us. He is very valuable to my business. I mean, he does such a great job. He's got a really good eye for detail. And I kind of struggle with that. So he can look at something and figure out if there's a piece missing, if it's broken. And sometimes I'll miss that because, A, I don't know a lot about the thing that I'm selling. And I just don't have that attention to detail. So it's really fun to work with him. And he's just really, it's just been really a great little side hustle for us, you know, for retirement. And it's been great. That sounds like it's it's paying the bills and, and then some. So I'm excited for you guys. It is. Have you had any of those that maybe those items that you shipped out where a part was missing or it, it needed some sort of repair and the, the buyer comes back and says, Hey, you, you misrepresented this item. It you know, wasn't received as described. Some eBay sales of mine and from what I've heard from other people can turn into this, he said, she said type of stuff. Like, I, I swear it was genuine. It was working when it left my house. Right. I had that happen. Gosh. And this was a freight shipment. It was some kind of an exercise machine. 
and I got it for free. The guy just had it listed. He said, I just want to get it out of my garage. So I sold it for $700. I had it shipped out and we had tested it right before we got it on the pallet. When she got it, she said it wasn't working. So I'm like, oh no. So I just thought, well, it was only $120 to have it shipped to her. So I'll just have her ship it back. So she shipped it back to me and my husband took it apart and realized she had plugged it into some kind of electric that was faulty and blew the little electric part of it. So that happens. Oh, geez. I sort of panicked and refunded her before I, because she was like really pressuring me and she was really upset. I understand you paid $700 for an item. You want it to work. But if, if I had handled it a little different because I'm a top rated seller, they said that they would have not refunded her. So I just panicked and refunded her. And then I was out basically just out the shipping, but it can happen. And I just recently did this. I sold a nice vacuum cleaner. I had got it all cleaned up and then the bag was full and I was going to have my husband change the bag on the vacuum. So I kind of pulled it out halfway and I thought, oh, I'll have him do that. And then he can do deodorize it and kind of dust the inside of it. Well, I forgot to pull the bag out and I sent it and the bag dumped out all over the inside of the vacuum. Oh, and no. this lady was so upset. And she's like, I cannot believe you sold me something like this. I paid for this and I'm never buying anything from you ever again. And of course I was crushed because I realized, oh, that was totally my fault. But I just decided I'm going to take responsibility, which I did. And I always read the scripture that says a kind word turns around, turns away wrath. So I just thought I'm going to be very kind to her. Everything turned around. I, she decided to keep the item. I refunded her a small portion of it and she was happy and said, I'm not going to report you. I'm not, I'm going to buy something from you again. If you have something I'm interested. So she was super happy. So definitely there's mistakes that we make. It's just all in how you handle them. I think, I think anything can be fixed. Is there anything as a seller that you can do to protect yourself against people claiming that an item is a knockoff or, you know, was not in the condition that you promised? Well, I think that's where the real attention to detail comes in. And that's really why I'm so happy to have my husband because he just really does have that attention to detail and he can notice things. And I think just taking your time, photographing anything that could be wrong with it, making sure you're very clear in your description. I do put terms and conditions in every one of my listings that, you know, these are the things I will do. These are the things that I won't do. And I think just really making sure that you take your time and let them know exactly, exactly what they're getting. And when we ship larger items that are more expensive, we have, since that happened with the lady who said that we got this item and it didn't work, we video test everything. That was one of the total quality management things that we added to our business that we can date the video and say, we are putting this up on the pallet. This is working and just do a total test of it on video. And that way we can prove that it was working. Yeah. Here, here's me plugging in the, the treadmill, walking on it, verifying that it works. Like don't blow the, don't blow the motherboard on it. Okay. That makes sense. Do you have a target profit per item that you look for? Or like if there are any minimum metrics that you're trying to achieve uh, per flip? You know, it used to be $25. If I could make $25, I would buy the item. But now it's more because I've gotten so much better at finding items and I know that the deals are never going to dry up. It stretched it out probably more to my, I want to make $100. I'll pick something for $25 if I get multiple items of the same item, you know, where I can list it once and still make $25, then I'll do it. But for the most part, I try to stick with if I'm going to make over $100, 50 to $100, I'll do it. What's been the impact of COVID on your operations here? That's the really beauty about flipping is it's totally recession proof. There's nothing that has really affected it. In fact, I think it's probably increased my business over the last several months. There's people at home cleaning out their houses, keeping busy, dumping stuff, you know, at thrift stores and having yard sales. People are selling things that they're not using because maybe they need the money or 
for whatever reason. So I think it's really increased. And the thing is with during recessions, not everybody's struggling. You know, a lot of people went from working in an office to working at home. Well, then they have access to their computer and on their breaks, they're on eBay trying to find things to buy because they don't want to go to the store to buy it. Or they're doing a home renovation because now they're spending all their time at home, homeschooling their kids and working out of their home office. So that's where the cooktops and commercial refrigerators come in. So like it really has, I think, increased. And I think that's kind of the beauty of the business. It really does. It's not really affected by COVID-19. And there's still very safe ways to source. You can do pickups, pay for it electronically, have them leave it out on their porch and you just do a porch pickup. It's very, very safe ways to still source during this time. That's what I was thinking of. I guess the sourcing going to be diminished just because people don't want to interact with other people. Yeah, I'm spending more time at home. I'm spending more time with my family. I'm buying stuff on eBay to support my hobbies because now I have maybe more time to do those things or outdoor hobbies. So yeah, that that makes sense. Appreciate you sharing that. And that kind of leads to the next question. I'm curious, like what's a, a day in the life, a week in the life? Curious about like the time that you're putting into this for the results, for the really, I think, outsized results that you're getting back or the impressive results that you're getting back? Well, when I started, I think I was working more. So I would put in, you know, 15 hours a week. And honestly, Nick, I could do it all day. I have to like kind of set parameters for myself because I enjoy every bit of it. I enjoy sourcing. I enjoy cleaning my items. I enjoy photographing them. I enjoy finding a good buyer shipping, communicating with my person that I sold to, making sure I give them excellent service. So those are, I could do it all day. But I think more that I'm now working less, I'm putting more to, I would say probably 25 hours between sourcing, getting the items listed and shipping. And I do a lot of that in the evening. My kids get done with their homeschool and we have dinner and then I head out. Everybody's kind of doing their downtime. And I just head out to the garage for a couple hours and get my stuff listed and, you know, ship stuff that I need to get shipped. And yeah, it's, I have a pretty good little system going. Okay. And that's kind of doing the online sourcing, like the Facebook marketplace offer up type. It's like, see what else, what's available, what's out there. Correct. And, you know, I've built a lot of contacts now in the business. So I have people who clean out houses or thrift store people. And so now they contact me when they find things. So now I have people searching for me and I don't have to do the work. Even though I enjoy that part, it still brings more of a profit to me because I have people now looking for me and they know what things I like and they know what things I sell. And then they just, you know, send me a photo. Do you want this? Sure. I buy it from them. And so it's just decreases the amount of time that I have to spend searching also. Yeah. How come that thrift store employee stockroom person isn't turning around and selling it themselves? Well, that's the thing. You know, he had a really beautiful sleep number and I love sleep numbers. I mean, it was one of the new models. It had everything, all the remotes, all of the, had a frame, one of the higher end frames that it had on it. And I knew the bed probably was $5,000 new for sure. He had it listed. He wanted to get $800 for it. So I told him, or he told me, because we built up a really good relationship and he, I feel like he really trusts me. And, you know, I try to give him fair prices for his things. And when I sell things and I do better than I thought, then I'll give them more because they have a ministry and I really appreciate their ministry as well and really, really respect the work that they're doing. So he said, well, why don't you take it, sell it, and give me the $800 when you sell it. So he had his guys bring it over. I put it into my storage and I sold it like a month later for 3600 I gave him his 800 and I got to keep the rest. So he knew he couldn't sell it locally because he had it listed even locally and he wasn't, wasn't getting any, any bites. So he really needed to have that eBay platform to be able to sell it for what he wanted to get. So that's where I came in and, and it worked pretty good. Has there been a, a dry spell? You know, maybe you go a week or a month and you're like, the deals, the deals are gone. Like I'm running out of inventory here. This is something that 
would worry me about this business because it's you kind of have to what's the phrase you kind of have to eat what you kill so which is a super weird phrase but like you always have to be uh out hunting for the next deal but no i think that's a fear that you have in the beginning because you're inexperienced you don't know that there's deals you know i would watch rob and think what in the world where is he finding these deals it was crazy but then i started learning from him and how to find my own deals and now i'm certain the only problem I had was last month I sold so much inventory. That was, I had 10,000 in sales. So I had sold lots of my inventory, but I just keep doing what I normally do. I'm keeping consistent, reaching out to my contacts, searching all of the apps and, you know, my inventory is back up and I'm ready to, ready to sell again, but doesn't make me afraid. I know that it's just a matter of time and I just, kicks in again. All right. Appreciate you sharing that. There's always deals out there. There's always people looking to unload this stuff and people like Stacy and like Rob to come in and take it off their hands. What's next for you? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go with this thing? You know, $10,000 months. What's the future hold? I'm excited about it because I've always wanted to travel. Even as a kid, 16 years old, my parents gave me an opportunity. They said, you can have a big party or we'll give you 500 bucks and you can go and travel with the neighbors who were going across the states. I said, forget the party and give me the money because I am going on a cross-country road trip. It's always been my desire. So it's been really cool because we can live off of my husband's retirement and that pays all of our bills. And basically, this is our extra money. So we have a couple trips planned and one is we're going to be going to Israel in the summer next year. So that's, that's just our focus and doing a couple things around the house we have a couple jobs that we want to do. We want to redo our bathrooms and our kitchen. And, and it's just nice because we can decide, hey, we need X amount to do this job in the kitchen. And we just, I just start, I make a little goal board and I put the goal on there. And when I hit it, then we can get the job done. I just love the freedom that I have with it. You know, I can travel, I can put my little store on vacation. And, you know, with this business, we don't have enough money to do everything we want to do, but we don't have to do anything we don't want to do. And I think that's like a really good key to a very happy retirement. And I'm sort of semi-retired because I can kind of not do it if I don't want to. And so it's just, it's a really good, it's just a really good business. So that's my desire. I just want to have that freedom to spend time with my kids and love my husband and do the things that I want to do not necessarily working because I have to. There's profit everywhere, as you have showed us, and I really appreciate you sharing the ins and outs of how the flipping business has has worked for you and continues to work for you. Stacy, thanks so much for joining me, sharing your story. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Well, several years ago, I was in a, a group of people and a missionary came to speak with us, and he was from the UK. And he said to this group, he said, Finish this sentence for me. And he said, anything worth doing is worth doing. And of course, we all said well or with excellence or, you know, we all finished that sentence that our culture says, you know, if you're going to do anything, do it well. He said, it's actually the opposite. He said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly because we're never good at everything we try in the beginning. So, I just want to encourage people, if you want to flip items for profit, get started. I've had so many people tell me, well, I would do that, but I would be scared of shipping, or I would do that, but my husband wouldn't like me to do that, or I would, I would do that, but I'd be scared I would mess it up. We all make mistakes. If you have a dream that you want to put together some cash, maybe you want to get out of debt, maybe you want to travel more. Maybe you want to spend t more time with your family or leave a job that you aren't happy with. Get started today. Like, don't wait another day and learn along the way. Everybody makes mistakes. And really, the mistakes are how I've gotten so much better. Because every time I make a mistake, I end up having some idea to do it better the next time. So, and if flipping's not your jam, Nick, you know, there's... 9,000 other ideas out there that you can, you should never stay someplace in your life that you're not happy with. 
because there's a million and one ways to make money and they're out there. You just got to find them and just start. They are out there. It's so true. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. I think that's a unique bit of advice in over 400 episodes. Really appreciate you sharing that. It, it ties in really well with, you know what? Every expert was once a beginner. Nobody was born knowing how to do this stuff. Stacy, really appreciate you joining me. Thank you so much once again, and we'll catch up with you soon. Stacy just teed this one up perfectly. We're never good at anything we try in the beginning, but with education and with practice, we're going to get better. All right, my top three takeaways from this call with Stacy. Number one is I can do this. I know I can do this. This was a soundbite of Stacy's that I highlighted during the recording, and it sounds kind of like positive affirmation, woo-woo type of stuff. Like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. But if that isn't your mental starting point, I think you're going to have a much harder road ahead of you. Now, I fully believe that everything is learnable. And to be sure, some stuff is simpler than others. But I thought the attitude of, I can do this, in combination with Stacy's number one tip of, look, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly, was really powerful. This is something that we're trying to instill in our kids instead of, I can't do it, trying to gently rephrase that as, I'm having a hard time figuring this out. I can do hard things. Hey, daddy, can you come help me with this? You never know how much this stuff is rubbing off until you hear it repeated back to you. Like my two-year-old will complain, I can't do it. And my four-year-old turns around and lectures him, we don't say can't. So I love that. Takeaway number one is this attitude of, I can do it. I can figure this out. Takeaway number two is to consider your alternatives. Another thing I liked about this conversation was the little goal board that Stacy mentioned, which sounded like it was a physical, visible thing in their house, and certain milestones on the goal board equated to family trips or uh, improvement projects around the house. And in your house, maybe that means erasing a credit card debt or buying a new laptop, whatever it is. But with those goals front and center, Consider your different paths to get there. Stacy mentioned she was making more flipping than nursing, so it made sense to focus more of her time and energy on the flipping business. She mentioned dog walking. And how many dog walks is it going to take to make the same kind of income she can make from just a handful of well-executed flips? I think the question to ask here is, well, what if it works? In the side hustle you're considering, what's a realistic best-case scenario? How profitable is that? How much time does it take? And does that align with your goals? So that's takeaway number two for me, to consider the alternatives. And takeaway number three was to become a deal magnet. Stacy phrased it a little bit differently. She said, never stick to one way of sourcing. In other words, diversify your deal flow, diversify your cash flow. And I'll caveat this. If you're just starting out, I think it makes sense to focus on one source of traffic, one source of leads, one source of clients, But as that source matures and hopefully stabilizes, cultivate source number two, work on source number three, and so on. You see this in freelancing. Like, hey, I find clients on YouTube, I find clients on Upwork or through a Facebook community. Everyone's first deal or client comes from a single source. Of course it does. But inevitably, over time, to build a less fragile operation, the sources expand. In Stacy's case, she mentioned building a network of contacts that can feed her profitable inventory, which actually echoed Rob's advice in episode 298, sidehustlenation.com slash 298, if you want to check out that call. But if you can let people know what you do, you can get first crack at the products. I think this is something that happens naturally over time as you become known for a certain thing. And I've certainly seen it to be true in my own businesses. By letting people know what you do, you can occupy that little brain space in people's heads that helps you essentially multiply your marketing efforts or your sourcing efforts in Stacy's case. Like if someone mentions side hustles, hopefully their little brain space is saying, oh, you got to go check out Side Hustle Nation. If somebody's trying to unload a big, bulky, random piece of equipment, hopefully it's uh, in Stacy's case, hey, I, I think I know somebody who, who might be able to help with that. That was takeaway number three for me to become a deal magnet. Once again, you'll find the full text summary of this episode and links to all the resources mentioned at sidehustlenation.com slash flip it. And be sure to check out Flea Market Flipper. There's a free workshop, at least at press time, through my referral link at sidehustlenation.com slash FMF, 
Rob and Melissa have taught a lot of people how to make money in this business, and they've been doing it themselves for years. SideHustleNation.com slash FMF. That is it for me. Thank you, Stacy, for sharing your story. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show, where I'm actually putting together a Where Are They Now series featuring some fan favorites from the archives. So we'll check in with them and see what's changed for better or for worse in their businesses. I'll see you then. Hustle on.